Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka, and we are filming this episode on May the 19th, 2020. Well, it's time again for another COVID update, and here to help us with that is Dr. Greg Poland, virologist and infectious disease expert uh, for Mayo Clinic, and our resident COVID expert. Welcome, Dr. Poland. Good morning, Helena. So good to have you here today again. Thank you. I'm wondering if you have any particular updates that you'd like to share with us uh, from the literature or things that we might have seen in the, um, in the news recently before I ask a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Um, there's been a number of interesting things that I, I think people will find of interest. One is a report that came out last night where they randomly tested people in uh, LA County and they found that 4.6% of them had antibodies against SARS CoV-2. Now, why is that interesting? They only knew about 8,430 infections. So this means for them to find these 4.6% that 367,000 people had to have been infected. In other words, a 44-fold higher rate of infection than what was actually known from uh, testing people who were symptomatic. Another interesting study uh, that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association last night looked at counties in Illinois and Iowa that bordered uh, one another. So very similar demographics, geography, et cetera. In Illinois, they had issued stay-at-home orders. At Iowa, they had not. And they found 30% more cases in Iowa where there had not been any stay-at-home orders. Again, talking about the power of the social distancing that we've been uh, engaged in. And then finally, a study that I think is uh, really important for healthcare providers, and that is looking at the operating characteristics of the PCR test to diagnose uh, COVID-19. So you recognize that there's a day that you're exposed, and then on about day five or so, you become symptomatic. So what would be the false negative rate all along there? So on the day you're exposed, the false negative rate is 100%. So it's 100% wrong. By day four, it's 67%. By day five, on the day that you're symptomatic, it was still 38%. So, uh, and by day eight, when most people were now developing symptoms, it was down to 20%. But it just makes the point that um, we can't, think of these tests as black and white answers that tell us exactly what truth is. There are probabilities associated with them. Those are really fascinating uh, stories that you shared. And I think it just uh, reiterates the need for prevention. We saw a little bit in the news yesterday about uh, vaccine trials. I I know there are various ones going on. And I know that you yourself are very um, interested in vaccines. And I was wondering if you could tell us what the state of that, what the state of that is right now. Yeah, great question. There are now eight vaccines that are in clinical trials, uh, four in the U.S. and uh, the U.K. and four in China. The results that were released uh, yesterday by press release, so we don't actually have a, a scientific paper where we can see the details. And the, and the press release is a, is a bit confusing, but there are the mRNA Uh, phase one results from Moderna. And what they had done is they took a 25 microgram and a 100 microgram dosage uh, and gave two doses. Now there were uh, 15 people in each of those arms, but they only reported results on eight of them. While they said that all of them had seroconverted, oddly enough, they only presented data on, on eight of them and basically demonstrated that those eight developed antibody levels equivalent to what we're seeing in convalescent um, serum. They had another group that was 250 uh, micrograms, and of course they also uh, seroconverted. But oddly, they then go on to say, despite those results, that in their, the next phase of their trial, they're gonna move the dosage up, the lowest dosage, to 50 micrograms and, and 100 micrograms. So. Um, still a, a very preliminary data. They did uh, also immunize mice and then challenge the mice with the wild virus and demonstrated that they were all protected. 
So we don't want to overinterpret that. And as you know, and we've talked about, there have been these uh, periodic press releases and various people touting one vaccine or therapeutic after another. And what we're finding is in a good deal of the time, these preliminary sort of press results don't end up holding up. And it just shows what we already know in science, that we need high quality, randomized, placebo controlled uh, uh, clinical trials that really tell us with high fidelity, are these results real or not? We don't have that yet for any vaccine. But these are encouraging preliminary data. It doesn't sound like we're ready to declare victory yet. No. But um, that's exciting that already there are um, you know, so many trials going on and it makes you hopeful. Yeah, yeah. Um, Greg, I wondered if you'd catch us up a little bit on um, this syndrome that seems or set of symptoms that seem to be affecting children uh, mm. related to COVID-19. Yeah, you know, it's got, a, it's got an interesting name and it's long enough that I wrote it down. It's called Pediatric Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome Associated with COVID-19. What's happening, and there are now, I think, roughly about 150 children who have been diagnosed with this in uh, New York City. This is a syndrome that's uh, inherently a highly inflammatory condition as a result of COVID-19 infection, where they're seeing sort of a, a hybrid between an atypical Kawasaki syndrome and a toxic shock-like syndrome. We've, we've seen that with other disorders, and it just speaks to the highly inflammatory nature. That's played out a little differently in adults. We've heard of COVID toes, for example, and these very atypical large vessel occlusions in people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So much so, in fact, uh, last, late last night, there was another paper released that was a... Uh, a clinical pathologic study of, I think it was 12, 11 or 12 people who had died uh, who had COVID-19 and did not have suspected thrombosis. And when they did the autopsies, they all had thrombosis and they had significant levels of, of clotting throughout their organs. So this is, uh, we, we have seen something similar to this with influenza, with herpes zoster, that people can have MIs and strokes. This is sort of that amped up a thousand fold where we're seeing widespread uh, venous occlusions, uh, arterial thrombosis. Some of the interventional neuroradiologists will talk about trying to fish out a large clot from a large vessel uh, in the brain. And while they're doing that, another one is forming. Uh, and some of this, even on uh, uh, um, heparin uh, prophylaxis. So the, the dawning conclusion is that when we have these patients, we're probably going to have to look at full anticoagulation of these individuals in order to protect them. That's something we haven't done before in a situation like this. You mentioned this concept of COVID toes, yeah. and I know that, you know, we've seen some talk about this. I'm aware of a, an individual who had a rash on their feet uh, went in and the dermatologist thought this was probably COVID, even though they were asymptomatic. Yeah. So are you saying that COVID toes is a really a, a blood clot? Yeah, it's really, it's really a small vessel and capillary thrombosis uh, that, that's occurring. Uh, we don't have any reason to suspect that it's a, a vasospasm. Uh, and so that's what we're, we're actually left with. Um, and again, what does this mean? It means that when we have somebody hospitalized, you know, when they're sick enough to be hospitalized, we're going to have to rethink, uh, do we anticoagulate these individuals? What, what's really interesting to me and, uh, and to you as, as physicians and as scientists is when you, when you stop to consider that over the last 17, 18 weeks, the amount of science that we have learned. I mean, if somebody came in with COVID on week one and somebody got admitted with COVID now in week 18, their treatment is inherently and completely different in terms of what we look for, how we treat them, how we ventilate them, whether we ventilate them, anticoagulate them, what drugs we would treat them with or not treat them with. 
This is unprecedented in human history. That really is a fascinating concept, particularly when you think about that many um, elective surgeries and appointments were deferred to allow for conservation of resources. And some of those resources clearly went into investigating uh, this virus and its um, symptomatology. And you know, some, you're, you're, you're exactly health. right, Helena. And that, and that has some ripple effects that we will have to deal with as a medical community. For example, um, many kids and adults now are getting behind on routine immunizations. And um, one paper showed that when they looked at COVID patients who had uh, frank COVID pneumonia, that 94% of them were co-infected with another pulmonary pathogen. Now, some of those are going to be pneumococci. Uh, depending on where you live, it could be measles, mumps, pertussis, influenza this coming fall. In other words, diseases that we have vaccines to prevent. So we're going to really have to think about this fall when we all expect a resurgence of COVID-19. How do we ensure that we are giving people the routine medical care that they need? It's still important. Um, think about patients with heart disease, with cancer, uh, the patients that, uh, that you see that are, that are suffering with, with uh, really chronic pain. Those are not things that we can put off for very long without having secondary effects that we don't want to have happen. And well, uh, some um, patients are concerned about going to get their immunizations and to get health care. It seems that some are not concerned about being together at all. I'm thinking of Wisconsin, where they, the court case, they recently reopened uh, um, many things in Wisconsin, and they were, they were showing pictures the next day of people in bars mm -hmm. and restaurants practically you know, mm -hmm. shoulder to shoulder and on top of each other. And I think this is probably happening in other states too. It, it very much is. Uh, and some of this reopening, which has to be geographic based on epidemiology, but you know, Indiana, for example, has had a, another surge in cases and yet reopening. Um, these, are, these are things that individual people, our listeners, are going to have to consider carefully. Uh, it's one thing to make a, a, a suggestion at the state or national level. It's another thing to look at the local epidemiology and make a reasoned decision, a discerning decision about what, what's best for your health. Here we've had some, um, it, it speaks to that people can be asymptomatic. You've, you've actually mentioned that quite a bit through this particular program with different, um, with making different points. But, um, you know, there have been some exposures which have been rather large, significant numbers of employees and individuals in our community oh, yeah. because they were getting together um, for some gatherings. Uh, and such. Nobody was symptomatic, but someone was, at least someone was infected. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Uh, when I talk to my neighbors, to, to lay people, etc., they sort of had the idea that, well, somebody would have to be symptomatic to spread it, or they have this unconscious idea that I could look at you, make a determination of whether you're likely to be sick, and then make a decision about whether, you know, to maintain social distancing. And We've seen this over and over. There's a, uh, last week, CDC reported a choir practice of 61 people appropriately spaced apart, but in a choir practice, 52 of the 61 uh, became infected and at least two died. That's astounding and so, very, so you, very sad. Yeah, you really have to understand that this is primarily uh, probably transmitted asymptomatically, and there's a, a lag period associated with this. So we have to be very thoughtful about this in terms of how we reopen. And as I've always uh, said, this is more of a, a rheostat, a, a, a dimmer switch rather than a light switch that goes on or off. Well, that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> uh, those great topics today. Do you have anything else to share with us before we go, Dr. Poland? Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, and, and it, it hooks on to what we were talking about before, a great value, and I know this is hard for people, the social distancing, the economic consequences have been really profound. But when you look at how we've gone from this in number of cases to this, and we're kind of, you know, halfway through the ball game here. If we can sustain it, just those weeks 
have enabled us to say to somebody who's admitted today that even those weeks of bending that curve down and delaying before you got infected have been enough that we know how to better take care of you and your survival rate is actually greater now than it would have been back then. So there is great value in what we're doing, even though it's hard to quantitate at a, at a population or public level. And that's actually some good news too. Yes. It's, it's, good yes. to, it's good to hear that things are improving that way. Thank you for joining us today. Of course. Dr. Poland, virologist and infectious disease expert from Mayo Clinic, giving us another COVID-19 update. Thank you too for listening and we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you, you too, be safe. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all the Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.